Uh, my name is Milton Hom. I'm a private practitioner uh, in California. Hi, I'm Catherine Mastroda, and I practice in New York City in a multi-specialty practice. Hi, Kathy. Hey there. So tell me about your red eye protocol approach. What do you do in practice? Um, you know, each each red eye case uh, is different, and with resistance in the back of my mind. I'm not so cavalier to prescribe antibiotics. So as part of the history, you know, the, the patient's medical history and the antibiotics that they've been on or have been taking comes into play, um, thinking about resistance models and mechanisms, how often they have the conjunctivitis, is this an isolated event, is it recurrent? Um, and, and, and importantly, how red the eye is. I will make use in, in most cases of point of care testing to try to dissect out whether perhaps this is just viral as opposed to bacterial and, and include that in my clinical decision making. So do you, you, you do like what the R RPS test? I'll do, an RP, yeah, I'll do an RPS test and you know, I will, you know, digest that information, but along with, with the clinical history and, and, and all the other signs and symptoms. So, so would you do that with a real, real red eye? That would kind of like cue you that it might be virus because it's really, really well, red? Well, you know, some of the, you, you know, the, the characteristic of an EKC or some, you know, the hemorrhagic, you know, conjunctivities, you know, sometimes make you think viral, whether they have nodes or if there's lid involvement as opposed to just more globe involvement. Um, you know, made me, made me suspect viral. Um, and, you know, the milder cases of, of, of antibiotics, you know, I just might, you know, take a, a weightful watch and see how um, it evolves because it may just get better. And indeed, most cases of, of mild conjunctivitis, bacterial conjunctivitis, will cure themselves in, in three days. So, you know, I may discuss this with the patient and say, you know, let's just wait and see. Um, or, you know, in a patient that's, that's a little bit. Um, more um, concerned about the redness, and I'm, I'm not feeling that I want to really prescribe an antibiotic. I might try a hypochlorous acid solution because it has antimicrobial activity, and that just may, may be enough for this case, and and um, you know temper my use of, of antibiotics and, and try to be vigilant. With you it. know, I really like that approach because I think the problem is that when we have something like conjunctivitis, is that we overprescribe for them, and I think a lot of the resistance problems that we do see, it's because there's an overuse of antibiotics, but just telling the patient to wait a few days, I, I think, I mean, I think that's, that's absolutely fantastic. The problem with that, as you know, is that they want to come into the office and they and, expect... And leave with something. And yeah, leave with something. exactly. So, you know, sometimes, you know, this, this redness or this injection, you know, may not be, it may be inflammation from a different source, you know, for example, blepharitis. So you tell, you tell the patient, look, you know, you have some inflammation on your lids, it's spilling over to the ocular surface. I'm going to give you this treatment instead. And you know, often if patients go home with a, a treatment, they're satisfied, which, which sometimes will work better than let's wait and see. But I mean, you can play both ends of it depending on what you see in that case and depending on, again, the back history. I mean, is it something, you know, were they here last month for it? Um, you know, have, you know, have they just had surgery? I mean, there's a lot of things that you'll want to know when you're, you know, digesting and, 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 and peeling off the layers of this red eye. You know, they say that the majority of physicians will prescribe antibiotics if the patient's parents pressures them. Right, you know, and you can understand, you can understand that as well because, you know, it used to be you used to go to your pediatrician and, and they used to come home with antibiotic, but now even your pediatrician will tell you, wait three days and if you know, you're still having a problem, you know, come in to see me and then you know, what do they do? Point of care. And then you know, they can discuss that with the patient as well. Yeah, and then uh, I, I've mentioned that before and I, I'm, I'm totally on track with the way you do things. Uh, a lot of questions I'll get would be, uh, but what happens? They won't let them back in school. You know, what you can do is, and what I can do is, you know, if you think if you think the child can go to school, if you think that this is something that's not contagious, and you have to feel comfortable in your own 
in your own you know clinical experience what you want to do with this patient you know maybe you do want to give them a note because you could be wrong I mean this could be something that you know needs treatment and children are not notorious for spreading things around and yeah maybe indeed that you know they should stay home from school but if, if, if you're thinking that well you know I think they're going to be all right by just waiting it out you can explore a different kind of of, of treatment, including uh, hypochlorous acid wash or, or um, you know, lid hygiene or, or something that, that doesn't involve antibiotic prescriptions. And, and parents too, you know, you have to give them some credit. I mean, they, they are in tune with, um, you know, overprescribing of antibiotics and, and allergies and, and sensitivity. So often they're relieved to know that it's something that doesn't need an antibiotic treatment. Some of the patients I think that I suspect for resistance would be healthcare workers. Absolutely. I mean, and if they're hospital workers, they come in and they got red eyes. It's like, oh, wait a second. Absolutely. So you know, as far as the history, you know, that medical history, you know, I, I find out, you know, I generally ask them, you know, and what do you do? I mean, do you work in the office? Do you work in the hospital? Um, you know, even though you know those hospital acquired resistance and community resistance, which used to be different, they're sort of dovetailing, and it exactly. seems that it, it's, it's all becoming a problem. But I think that that is key to know, you know, thinking about all those those other things. And, and you know, where I practice, we, we don't see a lot of contact lenses, but I know that you do a lot of contact lenses, and I'm wondering, you know, what's your trigger and perhaps a well, contact okay, let's, lens wearing patient? Yeah, let's say they're a nurse. They work in the hospital, and there's a... Uh, They'll tell you that a lot of red eyes are going on, or there's a lot of MRSA, or whatever it is. And, and they're they also slept wearing, in their lenses. And they're wearing contact lenses. they didn't have a break. They're wearing contact lenses. It's like, hey, yeah. I mean, that is the number one candidate that I would really, really suspect for some sort of resistant strain. Mm -hmm. and, so absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, um, you know, do you have them take out their lenses and prescribe an antibiotic right away or is, is it the, the intensity of the redness that triggers it or what if there's no corneal signs if it's just a it's just a conjunctivitis, just a conjunctivitis then I would be less worried about it but you know you're always worried when you're dealing especially with sleep in lenses you're always worrying about the pseudomonas elephant in the room right and then when you have this resistant pseudomonas that's out there then you get very, very concerned about treating it and being very, very, um, um, looking at it very, very closely and having them closely monitor. But I think any, as you well know, any corneal ulcer or any or corneal infiltrate or anything related to that, you got to watch it over very carefully anyway. Right, right. You know, and um, you know, in thinking about resistance, we always think about MRSA. But you know, one thing that really drives it home to me is that there is it's one uh, white paper th that there's um, a staph aureus, we always worry about pseudomonas, that was vancomycin resistant. And that really is a scary thing when you think that um, you know, some of our best antibiotics do have isolates that are not sensitive to them. So um, you know, in summary, I'm very careful with, you know, when I start an antibiotic, I'm very selective when I prescribe an antibiotic. And, you know, timing, recurrences, and, and history, and, and occupation, you know, all play into my decision making. Yeah, I was reading um, one comment from uh, an expert at the CDC, and they say that uh, bacteria will always find a way. They will always stay here long before us, and they'll be here long after us, and it's because of their, of their adaptability. And, you know, they, you know, in our one lifetime, they've gone through a thousand lifetimes. So they have the, the you know, the time and the, the um, genome to work to their advantage.